Welcome back to Think Tech. This is Global Connections. We're talking about religion today, the global emergence of the evangelical movement, of religion in general, with Dr. Rupmati Kandakar, who joins us today. She's our esteemed guest, our our uh, our uh, strategical analyst, if you will, who covers the whole world with us. Hi, Rupmati. Hello, hi, Jay, and thank you for having me. And Lovely to be back with you always, always, always. You know, when I went to law school, my roommate was uh, an Indian Muslim, and um, he had a prayer rug. Uh, pe pe people carried their books and notes in their attache case. Uh, Saeed car carried his in, in uh, his prayer rug in the, in the attache case. And uh, oh. five times a day he prayed. He was really, really, really serious. He followed all the rules. Um, sometimes it worked for him, and sometimes it didn't work. But I, I was impressed with that, and he was he was kind to me. Uh, he he showed me how to cook uh, uh, a uh, Madras curry dish uh, yeah. during. We ate only at night during Ramadan, <laughs> so I know oh. about that. Anyway, uh, come to find in Iowa, just oh. a few days ago, religion seemed to determine the outcome because the evangelists we've heard of them increasingly heard of them. Uh, voted as a block for Trump. Um, what I cannot understand, and maybe you can help me, um, is why. Because they're religious, they say. Um, they're passionate about their religion, they say. And the press mm. the press agrees with that, I guess. Um, but Trump is not religious. He's not certainly not an evangelical. He's, a, he's a, a Presbyterian, and he doesn't follow any of the rules, and he violates the rules and does things that would be immoral and inappropriate in any re any religion anywhere. So why then did he win with so much assistance from the evangelicals in this country? Have you got an answer for me? Mm, as speechless as you, Jay, but uh, religion has taken the forefront in politics everywhere. And so when you see Iowa, which had supported Trump around only 20% last time, goes up to 59%. And this overwhelming support for Trump is only fueling his, uh, uh, you know, his fervor. And uh, this, Jay, we see that they're non-religious. Uh, Trump is the most non-religious person that you can, non-moral person that you can find. But you find a set of Protestant people who believe in God, who believe in Jesus, who believe in goodness and the teachings of the Bible supporting him. So that becomes kind of a, a you know a, a point for uh, our reference and thinking. Ki why? But uh, Jay, you remember we had spoken a long time back about the Roe v. Wade uh, 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 decision by the Supreme Court. This was uh, given by Trump to them when they abolished the right uh, to abortion. That was Trump's gift to them. And when Trump gives such a overwhelming um, judgment for them they kind of go with his, this conservatism and, you know, this kind of uh, going back to the roots and going back to nature, by it's playing to their tune. And Trump is doing this very smartly. He has now brought religion into everything. You, you see any of his speeches, he'll talk to you about the Bible. He'll talk to you about, you know, things which hurt everyday people. He'll talk about transgender issues, gender choosing issues when they allow kindergarten kids to choose their gender. That is morally wrong for any any uh, any sane person. But this kind of freedom that they are giving to and at school level, so they, he's you know talking of the vulnerability of parents when they allow drag shows into school campuses. Um, you know, allowing this gender thing, uh, the, the men are allowed to uh, um, participate in women's sports. This kind of, uh, uh, what is that, imbalance in society, Trump is playing to the tune, Jay. He is uh, catching every soft corner, every nerve that hurts, and he is playing to the uh, crowd, Jay. And um, Jay, his um, crux, he's taken the Bible. Now, Bible is such a, when nothing fails, everything fails for a ruler, he always goes to religion. We have always seen that through the ages, that every ruler goes to religion. That is his ultimate weapon, Trump card, <laughs> as you say. That's hard to find a positive thing about religion. 
vis-a-vis uh, -vis politics and democracy. Um, the, the founding fathers were right to, to, mm. to prohibit the establishment of a, of a, of a religious state uh, and to separate uh, religion and, and, uh, and government. But that, that's changing now, and the evangelicals uh, seem to have uh, the upper hand, and they will have mm. the upper hand in the election, assuming that Trump uh, you know, takes the candidacy, and I think he will, uh, in November. They'll, they'll be playing from a religious point of view. And I agree with you um, that the, the abortion issue, his stand on abortion, um, wedded him to them, and they're yes. going to support him uh, in yes. terms of holding the line on that issue and maybe other uh, issues which have religious importance to them, but um, not necessarily to him. Uh, yeah. so it's, it's the old thing about one issue connection with the, the cult organizer, and everybody gets behind him, even though they don't agree with anything mm. else he's doing. But let's move east. Let's let's move uh, across the, the Atlantic to the Middle East. And yes. Europe, it seems to me Europe has become secular, where in those countries uh, 100 or 200 years ago were very religious. Um, mm. You know, the Catholics were wedded to Rome. Um, mm. and, you know, Germany was Protestant and so forth. Um, but they're secular now. Religion does not play an important role, I don't think. Um, but if you go into the Middle East, religion plays a very, very important role. And, um, you know, we know that uh, the largest single religion in the world is Islam. Um, and they don't fool around. They proselytize people by force. And yes. they have the Koran to justify using that force to proselytize people. Um, but the the terrorists who who say they're doing this in Allah's name, are they really doing it uh, for religion or something else? See, uh, Europe uh, is in such a uh, point that it's uh, in the middle of two proselytizing religions. Both religions have always survived on preaching and uh, spreading the message. Now. You have Islam and Christianity head on. You know, it's like a, a mini crusade that is happening. You have people going door to door and uh, speaking about Sharia law, about the goodness of Islam and trying to convert the uh, previously known uh, Christians to Islam. And uh, Jay, history speaks that Islam has always converted by sword. If preaching doesn't work, they go to force. And uh, you have this love jihad, you have uh, points where Islam spreads from person to person. They go from person to person. And that is very, um, uh, you know, in-depth in graining of Islam. So, Jay, this kind of Christ Christianity has divided into Protestant and Catholic. Islam is going by force on Islam. That is the problem, Jay. When the migrants come, they don't change the religion. First, if they had to adjust to a European society, they had to adhere to the Christian way of life. They had to follow a certain rule. And now you have halal and uh, uh, laws everywhere in Europe. So it's not a European country anymore that you go to. You go to kind of uh, offshoot of an Islamic country. They have, you know, you have a donor shop more than you have a pretzel uh, baking uh, shop. So that kind of cultural invasion that Islam brings in is extremely dangerous. Jay. We see that even in Israel, As Alaska mosque was not a mosque before. It was a Jewish site. They came and overtook it. They, they invade culture. And then the conflict comes after many, many years. They convert. They don't have places of worship. They will come on the street and worship. How many pictures have you seen where people will pray right down uh, next to the car or on the in the lawn of uh, um, you never see a catholic going and a protestant going in front of a tree and uh, bringing a cross and praying but they can do that in every street that is the visibility of the religion that they bring in and 10 people who see 200 people praying on their knees you will be like that religion may be something you know in curiosity kills the cat that kind of a thing and that's the way they convert young minds that's the way they doctrinate, uh, you know, youth. And yeah, well, but this... you know what? When, when, take a take a two year old child, and we, yeah. we've seen this. We've seen this many times. 
um, and going back years in my life, the two-year-old child hardly speaks in either uh, Arabic or, or Hebrew or English or anything. But the two-year-old child knows how to say, I will dedicate my life to killing Jews. Yes. But is, is the two-year-old child familiar with the Koran? Uh, does the Koran, you know, uh, give principles that the two-year-old child knows about? Is the mm. two-year-old child being trained in some sort of religion or in o only that distilled single statement, I will dedicate my life to killing Jews? Is that a religion? What, what is the nature of that religion? Intolerant, violent, uh, Islamophobia is real because J. Islam preaches jihad, jihad, and they call the other who does not believe in your religion as infidel, uh, a person who should not, who does not deserve the right to live, and the person who does not believe in your religion does not go to heaven; he goes only to hell. So this kind of extreme uh, uh, grip that they have over life, death. And you know, uh, the way of living and the, they even tell, the, the Quran even preaches that the way to deal with people who are infidels is to do away with them. So uh, when a child is learning Arabic and learning Quran, he'll not lead, uh, learn about the way of life. He will le learn that he does not have to tolerate anything outside his religion. And that's where the problem starts when you start growing up with this. I'm telling you, Jay, immigrants who come, came to Europe had to adjust to European way of life. Today, Europeans have to adjust to the migrant way of life. And that is a big danger because I don't see European ca cafes. <laughs> a little bit, you know, rare. It will be a rare uh, rarity in the future. They will say you have segregation of women and men. You know, they will bring the Islam way of life into the streets of Europe like it has already happened. But uh, migration was wrong because it brought in religious and cultural invasion jay that is the problem giving shelter giving uh you know uh, relief from your war zone everything refuge is brilliant but those coming in and doing cultural invasions is wrong now america is facing this in all the porous uh, borders uh, there was a case I, i'll tell you um jihadist head of Islam in Azerbaijan has reached the borders of uh, America. They were asking him, oh, where are you from? He says, you, you'll know soon who am I. And he's a convicted terrorist in 2019. So this kind of screening on religion will happen, Jay. And Trump was one of the people who was doing screening on the basis of religion. And he was called out for it, that he can't do this. And, he, and today, the reality that that was a bit right to screen on religion it was not against humanity because we are facing problems of this kind we are having these religious fanatics coming into a democratic country and going to threaten every democratic institution that this country stands on you know it's interesting and this is a friend of mine just came back from london and <coughs> uh, you know he was there when that hundred thousand um, group of people was in london um mm -hmm. protesting um, for the Palestinians, but also for Hamas and mm -hmm. and uh, you know, violent Islam, and um, you know his reaction was this is kind of funny because they came to Britain seeking mm -hmm. sanctuary. Yes. They came to Britain saying that things in their country were too dangerous to to too dangerous for them, so they had to leave that country and come to a country that was not dangerous that where they could enjoy, um, you know, the quality of life in, in Britain um, mm -hmm. and, for that matter, in the continent. Um, but they never really latched on to the culture that they said they wanted to join. This is so in Paris, too, by the way. It's, it's, mm -hmm. very, it's very accentuated in Paris. Mm -hmm. So you have these uh, communities that are really dangerous, as you say, and at the same time, um, they they are they came and they are still coming as a matter of sanctuary um, in order to escape the danger back home. Uh, it all seems uh, ironic to me. I'm sorry, very ironic. But let's let's move to um, let's move to to India for a minute. What what provoked uh, my title for the show was a couple of news stories 
about a, a church called uh, the Calvary Church uh, that was founded about 20 years ago and is now led by a fellow named Pastor Kumar. And Pastor Kumar has somehow uh, increased the size of this church. This is a gospel church. It's a born-again church. It, I guess you would say the Indian variety of uh, evangelical church. And uh, from a, a couple of dozen people 20 years ago, till now it has achieved 300,000 parishioners, and it has a dozen different locations in India and a number of other locations in every country in Central Asia around India, um, and it is going great guns. Um, mm. And, and that is important to understand, you know, what that is. What is, what is happening uh, for a Christian church in the heartland of uh, India? In fact, in uh, uh, Hyderabad, which is a Muslim city, mm. um, uh, that it should grow so quickly and be so successful. They have a, they have one, um, um, I, I guess you call it a temple, but it's really a warehouse uh, oh. that seats 18,000 people. And they have yeah. services a day. This pastor, yeah. Kumar, runs five services a day. It's just like the mega churches in the U.S. Um, hey. And his, 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 uh, his vision is to expand it everywhere in India and around India, and for that matter, the world. Um, mm. And so we have notions of, a, of global religions that are essentially uh, disconnected with old-fashioned Christianity. This is a, a newfangled religion kind of thing. Um, and, it, you know, it's, it's built on the, the same Bible, I suppose, but it's different principles and different ways of... Um, increasing itself. Um, can you explain to me what is going on with this church? Yeah, Jay, in India, you see uh, churches have a different kind of uh, um, setting. And this particular church that you speak about in Hyderabad, Muslim dominated area, and he's doing well for himself. But the problem with uh, these churches in India is that they used to learn uh, poverty stricken uh, people with uh, food, medical aid uh, for the sake of conversion. Conversion activities were on the basis of food and this. So that was looked down upon. If you teach and you preach and you get your converts, that is fine. But if you bribe and you try to get converts, that would not work. And now, uh, like you know, during COVID, how the rationing was free and is still free for below poverty level, we have around 13 million people who have come out of the poverty level. So people now uh, converting on the basis of poverty has reduced to such a drastic bit. And religion in India, uh, Jay, is always um, the majority. And um, one bit I want to tell you about the Ram Mandir being built. It it's was Hindu. inaugurated yesterday. Religion it's Hindu. In, in India is Hindu. That's why in Hindu the, uh, the, the India is different from Pakistan. Pakistan Correct. and Muslim. And India is Hindu. So what is a Christian church of this size doing in the very center of India and much more complicated in the very center of a, a Muslim city in, in India? Yes. Why? Why? We have the most beautiful uh, churches in the world, Jay. Some of the most beautiful churches in the world. But now, like you're talking of Mr. Uh, this one, Joseph, he'll be like, uh, you know, his activities will be monitor his activities is monitored why because if he converts on the basis of poverty that's what i'm telling you this point of conversion on poverty was looked down upon by many many both the castes even islam even uh, hinduism they did not want christianity was competing with them but christianity has always survived we have always had a good set of we had a, a meeting on christmas at the prime minister's residence so Christianity is ingrained in uh, Hindu society, Indian society. But this kind of evangelistic churches is a new thing. And he preaches 18,000 in a huge population is a minuscule amount. We find it very big, but there it is nothing. So, uh, <laughs> okay. it, yeah, uh, because too many people, millions and millions of people and 18,000 is like that. He'll present his case to the funding from abroad in such a way that 18,000 people attend my uh, this. 
but from abroad when you're funding you have a church in texas which will take only 500 people and you have this guy taking 18000 people you will fund him more and that is where the um, you know it's an imbalance that he presents he is not able to capture the heart of uh, the indian society that's you know it, it reminds me uh, maybe this is not a good comparison of the falun <laughs> gong in china uh, now the falun gong is not a religion it's just a it's a I think it's a uh, less than a religion. It's just a sort of culture thing. Um, mm. And yet the Chinese government sees it as a threat, a risk, a political mm. risk. And therefore they go after anyone yeah. who is associated with the Falun Gong and they put them in retraining camps and torture them and what have you. And um, you know, it's interesting that here you have this uh, evangelistic um, church of some size already it may not be that big compared to the <laughs> size of India, which is 1.4 billion already. But mm, uh, but it is certainly a, a phenomenon worth mm. uh, Mr. Modi's attention. And I mm. wonder if this presents a political threat to him. Your thoughts? Not at all, Jay, because they ha uh, you ha you have him riding the Ram Mandir issue right now. Three million, three million devotees in three, uh, seven million devotees in three hours at the inauguration. So that kind of uh, madness he enjoys. Oh, well, why and don't you explain the explain the Ram Temple? Explain the Ram Temple so people will know the significance of this with Indian religion. Uh, Ram Mandir was a historical uh, event in India and all the uh, media, Western media, the Guardian, New York Times, everybody has reported it as the temple being erected on a raised Muslim site. But the Muslim site was built on the birthplace of Ram. And after a struggle of 550, uh, 550 years, uh, India has finally got its Ram Mandir built and it's a magnificent temple and you have 7 million devotees Jay, entering and Mr. Modi did this single-handedly so he doesn't need to even, he's got the he celebrated Diwali on a day of 22nd August uh, 22nd January which is always celebrated in November so on call he got 1.4 billion people to celebrate a, a, a festival Jay. so that is what religion holds in Indian society we have pictures of the of the um, a Muslim church that was there before, the mosque, and, and the yeah. new, uh, relatively new, it's, it's only 20, 30 years old, uh, the new... And this uh -huh. is the temple that is being uh, made right now. So this, yeah, the mosque is gone. The mosque is gone. Because the mosque was built on a, a Hindu temple, which was uh, raised to the ground. That was on the birthplace of Ram. And that's where he erected this mosque, uh, general. So that was brought, and it's been, um, that mosque, that birthplace is since 7,500 years. So uh, I, I guess to, to draw some conclusion out of this is that India is um, is certainly a very religious place. Very, people very. show up uh, by the millions uh, yes. for an event like this. It's a very uh, ironic, a rather uh, iconic event. And... Um, yeah. And I guess what I'm saying is that um, Varendra Modi knows how to knows how to make political capital of this. He has elevated he's, himself. He's done something which was impossible, and it would have kept on uh, in Indian society for millions of years. Nobody would have done anything about single-handedly. He has done through his life. He started early on in his life campaigning for the building of the Ram Mandir. It means he was a person who used to be an organizer on the street. He never dreamt of being the prime minister. And when he became the prime minister, he has fulfilled his dream. And uh, it's, a, it's a journey which is, uh, is going, it's a lifetime achievement, you say, because he has done something for the Hindus, which nobody would have ever done. He so, he, so here, is, are, you, are you saying that, um, that India is more mm. unified uh, mm. under the Hindu religion than it was yes. before? Yes, yes, definitely yes, Jay, because uh, India never had caste. We had divisions on the basis of work. And when the British came in, they got a census in 1831 on the caste system of India. And they divided the Hindu society into caste. Untouchables, you know, you are from this caste, this caste. And it divided the Hindus. 
Yes, on 22nd of January, it was a day when Hindus came together as Hindus for Ram. And you imagine 1.1 billion people coming together, irrespective of state, irrespective of which caste they are, and uniting as one. This was, he united India in a matter of ministry. Entire India was celebrating a festival together for the return of Ram to his rightful place. Could so, this have happened without Narendra Modi? Never. Ne I, I, I emphatically tell you that never. It is a huge achievement. Religion, making somebody a king out of a political leader, this is it, Jay. Okay, now we're, now we're hitting pay dirt. So we're <laughs> going to try to draw some global threads here, some <laughs> global principles. We've yes. looked at how, uh, you know, uh, evangelicals are taking over political in process in the U.S., uh, yes. We've looked at uh, how how the how Islam is taking over. I don't know the third third of the, third of the world mm -hmm. uh, uh, and teaching children that all they got to do is hate Jews and they yes. hate some religion. Allah will bless them. Um, right. And then and then we're looking at India where um, you have two phenomena working at the same time. You yes. have uh, Reverend Kumar and his uh, his uh, extraordinary growth of of this um, uh, evangelical church. And, and I agree with you, it's it's all about feeding people, taking yes. care of them, becoming yes. a community. It's in our previous yes. show, we talked about how the Mormons have done that in yeah. the United States. If somebody yes. is down and out, they come and they, they're acting, yeah. acting as good neighbors. And so the evangelicals in Hybridad um, are acting as good neighbors and helping people out who need help. And this brings them to the church, uh, not only for their generation, but maybe for the generations to come. And the church becomes bigger and more important in, in the life of, of those people. Um, and then, of course, you have Modi, um, you know, developing this, this uh, new Hinduism um, yes. by taking this iconic church, I iconic mosque, and putting it aside and putting the old temple 500 years ago in its yes. stead, the birthplace of Ram. And so hmm. what, what we have is uh, an emergence of new political power um, on the horns of religion. Huh? Oh, lovely, lovely. Yes, right. Right, Jay? I mean, you can actually see that religion, every time a leader is presenting, going back to the Bible, going back to the uh, Ramayana, you know, you have these things uh, playing such a big role, big role. I, religion has come to the forefront of politics like never before. It was never like this. People tried to keep themselves apolitical, a-religious, a secular, mm, uh, no inclination towards any particular religion. That was the crux of the situation. But openly support. Even Trump said that he will not allow any uh, anti-Jew uh, activities on any uh, campus or any, you know, anybody supporting this will be thrown out of the country. That much he went. So supporting your right religion has become the in thing right now. And nobody's complaining about it because religious tolerance taught us that we were falling prey to uh, domination by one particular violent religion. <laughs> and that kind of tolerance was bringing us to our knees, Jay. We were at the mercy of any uh, uh, organization which was formed in the desert. They would come to your doorstep in a matter of minutes and you had masterminds who were plotting and planning on bringing down every uh, symbol of uh, democracy or religious tolerance that you had and you know it was falling flat on the face so we have this kind of brazen um, upliftment of uh, politics in such a way that they support the religion that they believe in. there is no pretense there is no appeasement and that kind of politics is appealing to the masses yeah, and Trump? but it, it yeah. also it also uh, maybe you can help me with this other phenomenon. It's the phenomenon of Vladimir Putin, the, <laughs> the master of propaganda and, and yes. disinformation. Um, you know, he's trying so hard to, to win the hearts and minds of every Russian, and with many Russians, he's failing. Um, hmm. But but with some, with maybe millions, he's succeeding. One of the things he does is he gets the uh, Russian Orthodox Church involved. Church. And yes. he corrupts the leadership of the Russian mm -hmm. Orthodox Church, and they support him 
as a matter of religion. They support his uh, his crazy war, invasion of Ukraine, um, and the expansion of, of Russia as a religious matter. And I'm mm -hmm. saying, where did that start? It certainly did not start with the with the church. It did not start with the church wanting to be bigger and more powerful, such as these other examples that we've been talking about. In this case, it's Putin who was who wanted to enhance his propaganda machine by using the leadership, the uh, the bishops or whatever their titles are, in the Russian Orthodox Church. So it's the other direction here uh, in Russia, right? Uh, so he's yeah. using the church as something to enhance his power, even though yeah. he's he's not religious at all. He's a completely secular person. Um, what do you think about that? How does that play with the investigation you and I have been making here today? He does the most immoral thing of war, and then he goes and shows himself to be very religious and bows down and everything with the Orthodox Church. And that has happened on many occasions. I mean, you really see, when you visualize Putin, you see him as a very religious, pious man. But the things that he does are completely different. And he is uh, really catering to uh, anti-Christianity uh, or anti-Jewish uh, agenda. Jay. He supports these people to a tremendous extent when they can attack Israel. And, uh, um, you know, that kind of double standards doesn't work well. You cannot, I told you, appeasement politics, it's, you cannot play both sides. You have to take a side which is right and which is wrong. If you play in the gray zone, white or black, if you play in the gray zone, he's going to find himself in such a mess. And uh, Jay, the more uh, transparent your actions are, the more clearer you are in life. And he is not clear about many of his actions, not all of his actions, when he does this. When he tries to show that, uh, cloak his actions with religion, he tries to show that he is pious, but he is not. He is doing, he is having wars which are of a tremendous uh, catastrophic event in countries. He is wiping out countries. He doesn't care about life. Religion is all about morality, caring for the other, respect. That doesn't work anyway. So, uh, He's just using it. Now, uh, when he talks of China, China is brazenly bringing down Islam. Brazenly. U Uyghur Muslims, the Uyghur camps, they are not allowed to put uh, Islamic uh, signs on the board. They are very clear that they don't like Islam. Uh, Putin plays the uh, balancing act, seesawing between Christianity and uh, Islam. That that will hurt him very badly. Jay. He has to take a proper right, rich, right stand. Stand with one side. Don't play both cards. That is always there. Uh, uh, such <laughs> uh, such interesting uh, vectors, uh, such interesting connections here on Global Connections. Rupani, <laughs> I really have enjoyed this discussion. I learned so much. <laughs> I think the best talk shows we have on Think Tech are, are the ones we, we learn things that we never anticipated we would learn. It's lovely talking to you, Jay. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Rupati Kandakar, for this great discussion. Talk soon. Thank you. Always. Thank you very, very much.